And since you are experienced Java developers, we'll make it short. I was not sure if I even should show you the slides, to be honest with you. But I decided to split it in two, so I will spend half an hour showing you the slides. Then I will stop. If I didn't finish the, if I don't finish the slides, you can download them and on the last slide. I also use the location, or you can go to slide share, slide something .net, slide share. You can find me there, and on GitHub. On the last slide, I'll show you. So you will get the slides definitely. If you want to look at the code, you will get the code as well. It's all on the GitHub. So my name is Yakov Fein. I work for com the company Parapa Systems. Actually, I'm one of the co-founders of this company, and we have another company called Surance Bay. It's about the software industry, and in the software industry, we already created and put in production an application in Dart. The front end that you can see, it's, it's about finding insurance agent that can sell you something. So the front end is done in Dart. The back end is Java. So we do all, all middle tier in Java, of course, easy insured. And it works fine. Why, why we decided to go with Dart in general? Uh, because so far we couldn't find a better replacement for Adobe Flex. We've been doing Adobe Flex for many years, and then, you know, the story with Flash Player, somebody said it's not good. And we started to look around what to replace it with. <coughs> JavaScript is not there yet. In terms of productivity, we started to give JavaScript to our developers, and we see the drop in productivity tremendous compared to Adobe Flex. Like, what we could do in a day in Adobe Flex, in JavaScript you would do in a week. <laughs> that, that bad. But you can, you can be so smart as guy if everybody else is going away from Flash Player, which is a wrong time for Flex. We decided to find something that is not as bad as uh, JavaScript that was back then. And uh, Dart from Google seems to be okay in this regard. It's not a replacement in terms of productivity, but it has a good set of tools that let us develop the product and deploy it in production. So, technically, JavaScript is still the language that will be deployed in production. But today, probably one of the best ways to write JavaScript is Dart. Just think about it this way. Dart is a way to write JavaScript. So you will be programming in Dart, but eventually you will be deploying in JavaScript anyway. Even though there is uh, Dart VM, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but um, JavaScript is dominant language uh, on the planet for the front end, and it will remain the same, and especially now when ECMAScript 6, the next standard for JavaScript, will be finalized this summer. And as a matter of fact, like most major browsers support already 50% of the, of the syntax of ECMAScript 6. Uh, Firefox, the latest version, 69% of the language. So what is Dart? If you know Java, technically you know like 80% of Dart already, the syntax. In some cases you will see and you will think that it's written in Java. So that's why it makes it much easier for us to learn. If you remember many years ago when Java was created, it was created like a, as a more simple C++. So we can say the same thing about Dart. Dart is a more it's a more simple job. So, it, you, can, you can program with classes if you want, and we want it, right? If you don't want, you don't have to program with classes. Uh, then, you, you can declare variable types. If you want, if you don't, uh, Dart VM will figure it out all the time. Uh, any class is an interface in Dart. So you don't have to use a keyword, there's no keyword interface. If you have a class, and this class has public methods. You can say that class A implements that class. And all of a sudden, you, you have to implement all the methods from that class. So no data access qualifiers, public, private, protected, and default package. So it, by, by default, everything is public. If you want to put, if you will name a variable with an underscore, then it, it's, it's going to be private. But it's not as private as we are used to in Java. It's library private. So you create a bunch of classes, and you say that these classes belong to a library. And if you will declare a variable with underscore, it's a private for the library, for the group of classes. You can group any classes in a library. Single-threaded. 
The language is single thread. But it supports concurrency in a special way that is called isolated. I'll show you a demo today. Then exceptions. Same as in Java, but. I mean, you, you also write try and catch and final, but you don't have to uh, write it. So it's not, it's not a must uh, to write the exception handle. No check exception. No order boxing in boxing because everything is obvious, technical. IDE that supports Dart, everything that you know. Eclipse, IntelliJ IDEA, uh, WebStorm um, from them. Then you can use uh, text editors, Sublime, for example. And um, support is pretty good. And finally, you will write it, you will develop it in Dart, and you will test it in Chromium, which is a special build of Chrome browser with Dart VM inside. So you will be developing and debugging in Dart, but you will be deploying in JavaScript. Google recently officially announced that they are not planning to uh, include Dart VM in any other browsers, not even in Chrome, in their own. So they decided to concentrate on making better tooling which will which work with JavaScript. It's not like any negative news at all, but just keep it in mind. So you will be developing in uh, with Dart VM, but you will not be deploying in Dart VM. Why it's great? Why developing with Dart VM if I will not be deploying it? It's much more productive when you do it this way. Uh, you will you will have static code analyzer. You make a mistake you, while you write a, the program, immediately it, it'll help you out saying that there is something wrong. Running in Dart VM is very fast. As opposed to Java, uh, they decided, Google uh, developers, Google creators of Dart, decided not to introduce bytecode at all. They said when Java creators did it, they had in mind the situation when they build a platform and many languages can compile into the same bytecode. And since they never had this goal, so they were at the luxury of writing the code that just simply runs. And it works really fast. So there is no pre-compilation required. So as opposed to GWT, I'm sure somebody will think, why bother, we already had a product from Google, GWT. Uh, but in GWT, you would need to write in Java, then compile it in JavaScript, and then debug, uh, debug JavaScript. Not the case here. You just write a program, and you run it as is. As is. And only then you deploy it in, you, you transpile it in JavaScript, which happens very fast. The programs in Dart can run standalone or you can write a web application in Dart as well. So the entry point of any Dart program is a main method. Actually, they call it a function. Of course, it's a function, main function. Main, this is, this is hello world, right? Uh, you see parentheses, empty parentheses after main. If you, want, if you want to pass command line parameters, do that, but you would need to uh, add an import a special package for that. Uh, for, like in here, I decided to import package args that happen to support uh, command line parameters. If you don't need them, don't bother, don't include it. So in, this is what we have, like you remember, like in Java, string, uh, array, args, this is, it, this is what it is. It's the same thing, but again, it's optional. There is check mode, which is more strict, and there is an unchecked mode, which allows you more freedom. I will not go into detail because we don't have much time. Uh, Importing packages, import statement, very similar to what we have in Java. You will put some import statements, but Dart comes with a small number of libraries. And these libraries start with the word Dart. So when you see import Dart something, it means that it's come with language. But there is a central repository, similar of course to Maven, but of course not as big as that, which has like more than a thousand packages. So if you see import and package something, it means that it's an additional package which you can import. So these are the libraries that come with Dart. For these, you don't need to, to import anything. But you can define package dependencies. When you create a project, any project in Dart, it has to have a little file called popspec.yum. And in there, you specify dependency for the build process, what your project needs. 
In this case, it's, it's called stock called console, the version, description, whatever you want, which has decayed, needs, it, it's greater than one and less than two. By the way, the current version of Dart is 1.9.3, is the latest one. And dependency, you can have dependencies for runtime, you can have development dependency as well. Arts, in this case, arts, we need a package to parse command line arguments, right? Any version, right? And maybe we need something for unit test. So this is the package. And there's, they have a tool called pub. And when you run this tool from the command line, from the directory which is the same as this, where this file is, is located, then it'll check the dependency and it'll pull the required dependency from the internet. In particular from um, this pub.lang.org, which has more than a thousand packages already. Some of them created by Google, some of them by third party. If you want to log the version, there's another file called pub's backlog. And this pub manager has a bunch of different commands. Pub get to retrieve dependencies, right? Upgrade. Pub serve is a it's a little web server that exists right there. It, it comes with Dart. So whenever you if you want to test something, you can do pub serve. It'll bring it up. It'll check the dependency. It'll start the server on port by default. It's 8080, right? And then uh, you can point your browser and see how it works there. I'm using IntelliJ IDEA for Dart development, and uh, IntelliJ IDEA happened to have its own web server, so I don't, in some cases I need to build uh, the product, but to test, to play with it, to show you these examples, I can run everything just from IntelliJ IDEA without, uh, without explicitly running this pub. But IntelliJ IDEA supports it really well, and it also starts pub automatically. So, uh, the pub build is a process that allows you to build and package the application for deployment. So, this demo we'll skip for a second. Let's move on with the, with the theory. Dart classes. Name, name, uh, you name classes with small letters. This is not like in Java. In Java, the name of the class will be the same as the name of the file, at least if the class is public. And uh, you just separate, uh, you, you can build it from multiple works, separate it with uh, uh, underscore. So it's a, it's a convention. Constructors. I'll show you constructors. They have a nice short syntax for variable in initialization, no keyboard, public, protected, and private. And I already said if a variable name starts with underscore, it's private per library. Language doesn't, has, doesn't have a method overloading. And because of that, the next question is, can I have more than one constructor in a class? Yes, you can. And they introduce something called named constructor. So if you have only one constructor, it's going to be having the same name as the name of the class. If you need more, then uh, you will just add something behind, uh, after the dot. Getters and setters are great. Uh, getters, they, they are the way that's supposed to be in Java or something. So you use the word get. And set. It's not like get something as a, as, a, as a method. The getter can be a property or you can uh, replace it with a method. Let's take a look at this example. Since we are in financial area, so I'll be using examples with the stock because it's many people understand in this room, right? Class stock. You, we declared a couple of variables. Both of them are private, right? Why? Because they, are, they start with underscore. This is a constructor. And look at this, it's, it's just one liner. So, but it's a special short notation. When, you, when I say this dot simple, it means I want to take an argument from the constructor and assign it to the variable that is called simple. Because in many cases, what do we write in constructors? We take the variables and then we say this dot variable equals the argument. And this is the, this will do the same thing, but much shorter. Now, this is a getter get. See, you, you put the word get and then the name. So when you say my class dot something equal whatever, you are using a setter, right? And you don't know unless you will open up the source code if you are using a setter as a method in sense class or maybe it's, it's a variable. So in this case, uh, I'm using a one-liner one -liner, uh, method to get the price. This is a fat arrow. 
in a way, it's similar to lambda notation, but it's uh, only if the method has only one line, like in this case, getter. This getter is lazy getter, right? So if we never, uh, if, if we never wanted to get the price, if it's null, right, then we'll, maybe you'll get it from Yahoo. Otherwise, we'll just return it. Setters, the same way. You put the word set, the name of the setter, and then do whatever you want in there. If you don't want it to be a method, just remove the set and uh, make the variable public and nobody else will notice. You don't need to change any code. And uh, in this case, it's set for simple. So pretty simple. So if you want to create a new instance of this class, very similar to Java. Over here, by the way, over here, uh, we are passing the, uh, the, sim the value <coughs> IBM, but the variable equation, take a look, I put var in here. I could have used the type, the type of the variable, int, for example. But since I put var, uh, Dart is smart enough to figure out uh, what is the type of the variable. Constructors. As I said, there is no overloading in Dart, so what they have is mm, name constructor. See, this is a regular constructor, and this is a name constructor. Customer dot tux exempt. So I would need to say if I wanted to use it, I would need to say new customer dot text exempt and in parentheses the arguments. Uh, you can use optional parameters in the constructor, and they have something called factory constructor. Like factory design pattern is already embedded in the syntax of the language. So in this case, depending on certain value. It'll build either one object or the other, or I mean one way or the other. So that's the uh, construction. Cascade operator, very simple and nice. Uh, look at this notation. It just saves you from repeating the name of the object. It's not the same as chaining in streams in Java. It's not, because in streams, when you chain methods, you assume that the previous method also returns your stream. Not the case in here. This, this is about the first object that you are referring to. In this case, query selector, we want to get some reference of the, for the object from the web page. And uh, instead of writing the reference variable for this object, we say dot dot text. Now we immediately assign something to the text property. And then again, we uh, change the CSS uh, of the object. Again, it's to the original object, not to the return of the previous method or something. And immediately we assign the uh, click uh, event handler. We listen for the click, and whenever click happens, we want to do something. Exceptions, similar to Java, just a little bit different. See try and catch. But what do you catch? You put like on and name of the error that you might expect. If you want to catch everything, just say catch and then the variable. As opposed to Java, in Dart you can throw any object. It doesn't have to extend from throw. Just whatever you want to throw. And the code structure. The code structure is something like this. You have classes, functions, <coughs> abstract classes, think interfaces, and mixins, kind of multiple inheritance. All what you write you, you package inside libraries. Libraries can be uh, grouped into packages, so you deploy packages. How do you say that a bunch of classes belong to a library? So right there, you, you say you start your code with library and give it a name. Then you put imports that you want. All imports go in one place, in here, in this first uh, file. I'm, I'm not saying class, a file. This file has a main method, and you can put all the imports in there. And you say, my library has the following parts. Stock.dart and stock.generator.dart. These are two different files. So we are grouping these files into a library. Accordingly, in each of these uh, files, we say that this file is a part of the library stock code. So the library has parts in each of these the files is a part of the library. So this is how you do it there. Mixins. A mixins is you have a class A extends class B. And, and all of a sudden you want some additional functionality that is not inherited. 
multiple inheritances is not officially supported, but you can mix in a bunch of methods uh, from a third or fourth or fifth uh, classes. Uh, in Java 8, interfaces also can, uh, can include now static methods, right? Default methods, but they are not mixed things because in interfaces you cannot have state, right? Uh, in, in, in Dart you can. So this is an example. Say you have a class security with a name and a constructor. And you have a class stock that extends security. It has symbol, previous closing price and constructor. And you have a class bond. It also extends security, but we want some additional information. Say we want to report trades uh, of bonds in a special way and uh, stocks in a different way. So down in the bottom you have class trade reporter and we use it as a mix in. You put in there a bunch of functionalities that may be useful somewhere and as soon as, as wherever you need it you just use a keyword with. So class bond extends security but with mix in. So now class bond will have everything that security has, plus you can use these uh, methods and uh, the state variable as well. Down there you can see I create an instance of bond and then I am assigning where to report even though it was not declared in the bond class, right? It came from the mixin. And I'm invoking a method from the mixin on the class bond. That's mixin. How to develop uh, web applications. Again, I want to stress that you, want, you can write a program in Dart, there is Dart VM running from the command line if you want. If you want to run it from the server side and on the client side as well, do it. So you can write an application which has web application written in Dart and the server side is written in Dart as well, if you want. If you want, you write the server side in Java. In the web application, what you do is you include the, the source of the main method, right? And you specify that this is a type. This type is understood only by Dart VM, of course. Any uh, other browser, uh, other than Chromium, doesn't understand what it means. So what you write is, at least what you've written before, before the latest announcement. You're saying, this is a Dart file. And the next line would mean, I crossed it out because this is not how we should do it now, but it would say, if this browser doesn't support Dart, please compile it on the fly into JavaScript and download it. So the second line would do the trick. So this thing would do the trick. Now, since we know for sure that Google says that we will not be deploying Dart but only JavaScript, we usually pre-compile either manually or we using use special transformer that will do it automatically for us. It'll replace the HTML file and it'll keep there only one file assuming that this JavaScript is already compiled from our code. So technically you will be deploying JavaScript. How do you run it? You can run it from a command line. I'm talking about web application, right? You can say pub serve and it'll start the web server and it'll open up the index HTML that you have in there. Or you can run it in your ID. Again, I use ID, idea, so I do right click on index HTML, I run it there or I debug it there. Uh, this is a screen that shows you if I would be running in Dartium, I would be having this out. It would just simply run HTML, Dart, CSS, and everything. If I'd be running it in Chrome, which does not have included Dart view, I would have these blue things little. See, Dart to JS, it's a compiler. It automatically compiles Dart into JavaScript. So this, this is little extra step that will be done on the first run, and then it's not needed. And working with DOM is pretty simple. It's very similar to what you do with the other languages. Query selector, and like you do with CSS, you find an object, and then you use this uh, reference object for further work. Event handling in web, again, pretty similar. You got the, the reference to your DOM object, and then on event, on change event, I want to assign a listener. What is a listener? The name of the function. It's right there. So a simple stock web application. I will run it uh, in a couple of minutes, but 
basically, I, I wrote a little program that generate fake stock quotes, and uh, you enter the symbol, you press the button, it starts the class and generates the stock quote. <coughs> Debugging, how do you debug Dart application? Uh, you, if you are developing in Chromium, and you will be developing in Chromium, otherwise what's the point? Just write in JavaScript. Then you just debug it there, and in Chromium you can open up a Google Developer Tools, like in Google, and in there you will be seeing Dart source code. And you can put breakpoint in Dart, and you can debug <coughs> Dart. In IDEA, the same thing, you, you install extension for Google Chrome, for JetBrains support, in that case, if you want to work this way, then you're going to be debugging an idea using regular debugging. Set breakpoints and just run. Asynchronous program. For asynchronous programming, they have futures. Futures. So you de declare a variable of type future, and then you invoke some method. Say you have some slow running operation that needs to uh, access something on the server and you want to run it asynchronously. As you know, the main problems with any GUI tools is frozen screen, right? We don't want to freeze the screen. So the user should be able to enter and use the screen regardless of how long that operation works. So we want to do it asynchronous. There are special um, tricks to be done in some cases, but the idea is you declare a variable of type future, future equal, and call the method, which is long. So what you get, you will immediately get a reference to unfinished result, so to speak. Future is, a, is an object, but it's not ready yet. When the result will come back, I don't know. It will come eventually, hopefully. So when the result will come back, there will be a special method then that will be called on the future. If you have an error, you can catch the error, and there is another method for that. Uh, Dart includes a couple of uh, keywords that simplify work with future. Not simplify, it's, it's made the code more readable. Instead of having, I create a future and then, which is, and then you specify a callback, what to be called if the result comes back. Uh, with async and wait, it's, it's a little bit simpler, but the idea is the same. So future, async, and await are things to be used for asynchronous execution. But don't confuse asynchronous with concurrent. Remember I said that Dart is a single threaded language. One thread. So there's no miracles. There is no concurrency in one thread. So asynchronous is fine, but the way it works internally, if you make a request to the server to get some data from there, Technically, you are using a thread from the browser, right, for that thing. And that's why we are cool and smart and we can keep working with the UI. But if you will make, if you will call a method that also is written in Dart and run a long running loop, I tested this, maybe I will even have a chance to show it to you today, then the screen will be frozen. You, can, you, you cannot have competing Dart, uh, Dart functions within the same Isolate. Now we are coming to isolate. So isolates are about concurrence. In a minute I'll tell you what the isolates, isolates are, but for now just remember that asynchronous is not concurrent. If you want concurrency, then please use isolates. This is a nice diagram that I wrote to represent a future. So you are calling a function which is slow. It immediately gives you the future. And then you attach then on the future. See, you declare future equals slow operation, and then you say future dot then, sometime result will come back, and it will be handled here. And this is, let's say, slow operation. Error handling, you do stuff and you have then. If everything is fine, then uh, it will be called, and callback for success will be invoked. If you have an error, the error will be called and the control will go there. Uh, sync and await is just a little bit different syntax, but it makes things simpler. So you are saying the calling function and you have this modifier called async. async. You're saying that this 
this code will be executed asynchronously. And the keyword await means I'm running a slow operation, please wait for me. Sometime later when it's gonna be ready, the code will continue right there. So there is no need to write callbacks and you can use try catch if need be. So await in the sync. Ajax is pretty simple. You have HTTP request object. You can do get string uh, if you use get, and so on. You can use all these standard uh, operations. HTTP request is an object specifically for the web, and they have another uh, class HTTP. That why? Because technically you can write programs in uh, Dart for the server as well, right? So not everything runs in Brown. Now concurrency. Concurrency was isolated. I've spent maybe three more minutes and then hopefully I'll start to show you some code. Isolate. What they created is like a special separate piece of memory where that, where your code can be running in parallel. You can start multiple isolates and they, each of them will have its own heap memory and you cannot ever access the variable <coughs> located in another isolate. So what you can do, you can send messages. When you write a program in Dart, it's a main isolate. You always have at least one. If you start another isolate, it's a separate execution. If you want to communicate with them, then you will be sending messages. But you never access anything inside, so there is no uh, race conditions or anything uh, like an issue. Every isolate has two ports, input port and output port. So if you want to talk, if you two isolates need to talk, then you communicate through these ports. Send and receive. You can start isolates either from a standalone application or from inside the browser. In the standalone application, of course, they are but of course, they are isolates in a standalone application. And they can be using a multiple cores. If you have multi-core CPU, and I'll show it to you in a minute. So you can, if it's a standalone application, you can use the method spawn to spawn a new isolate or spawn URI. In browser, you can use only spawn URI. And when you are in browser, again, we are deploying JavaScript, so isolates will be implemented etern internally as worker threads in JavaScript. So each isolate will have its own uh, worker thread. Again, you don't program it, it's, be, it's going to be done for you. And these spawn URI as well are also useful to load, dynamically load extra code. You can say, I want to uh, start the code that is located at this URI, which can be a file name. So you can dynamically load pieces of code. And we are almost done with the slides. Uh, Dart WebSockets. I was playing with WebSockets. Uh, and we are using WebSockets, and in my opinion, it's a great standard, and it's supported fully in Java and everywhere, everywhere else. All browsers work with WebSockets. And uh, I, I created a simple demo just to, to, to test it. So I created an instance in um, an instance in Glassfish, which is a Java server, right? and uh, that Glassfish pushes data, in that case it pushes time, to the front end. The front end is written in Dart. So this is a client in Dart. This is how you write a client in Dart for WebSocket. In this case, I open a WebSocket. <coughs> in local, local port 88, I will be running Glassfish. And this is the name of the application, slash clock. Uh, uh, clock is it's a path, a path annotation like, like in REST. I don't know if, if you work with WebSocket, similar thing. Poja with annotation. And on open, we start listening. When data comes from the server, we display the text on the screen. Uh, in this case, I, I on purpose, every, every example that you see in the books on WebSocket, they say, take a look, the client makes, sends a message to the server and the server responds. So what's the point? We don't need request response. The whole point of WebSocket is that it's a full duplex, right? So any side, being that server or a client, can initiate the conversation. So in this case, on purpose, I don't send anything from the client, I don't request anything. I just connect and the server will start pushing data right away. And how the server can push the data, it's right there. This code is in Java already. So this is an endpoint, a WebSocket endpoint. I 
annotated with clock. Remember this clock over here? And uh, what I do is, what I do is, I, when I get the request, the session object in WebSockets gets information about all the clients that are connected. I get open sessions in plural, just to know how many are connected, because I want to push to everybody. Assume you are pushing the price quotes for the stocks, right? In this case, I'm just pushing the time. So in a loop, uh, to all collection for sessions, for as many as I have, uh, in here I check for one. Uh, I just do have a timer, and uh, every second I, I invoke this method, send time to all, send time to all is here. So basically it pushes the data, uh, pushes the data to the cloud from the server. So I'll show you, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, tools with uh, Dart. And uh, as uh, Google uh, evangelists say, uh, batteries included. Because it, it, and it does. You, some people say, why is better than CoffeeScript or than uh, TypeScript? TypeScript is just a transpiler that converts it to uh, JavaScript. But in this case, it's a full ecosystem. <coughs> so it has uh, everything, basically. Uh, there are some links, and uh, write it down if anybody is interested. The first one. The first one is github.com, Farada is the name of our company, slash dark. The slides are there, and all the code examples are there as well, if anybody wants to download them. Github.com, slash Farada, slash dark. And the links. These are uh, books. Uh, this one I co-authored last year. Uh, in a week, the new Java book, the second edition, they published with seven hours of video tutorials. It's uh, Wiley Rocks. It's out, and uh, in September, Java for Kids is also going to be out. So I'm done with the slides, and I have like 22 minutes, or maybe a bit less. I will just run some code. So uh, we are in uh, IntelliJ IDEA. So with which supports Dart file new if you wanted to create a new uh, something new in my case I created a project and I keep adding modules to the project if I want to create a, a new module for example or a project I would say new which one it's right on the menu Dart right when you do next oh sorry over here there's a bunch of templates you can you can pick you can say I want to create a console or I, I want to create a web application this and that so it's all there. I'm not going to be doing this, but trust me, this is how I created all these modules. Just a couple of couple of examples. Very simple web. Uh, stock uh, quotes web. So the structure of the project. If it's a web application, you will have a web folder. But in the project, remember I told you about this file, uh, mm, pub spec YAML. This is dependencies. This is very, very good. In the web folder, you have index.html which has nothing in my case, just the place, the span where I will be displaying the data. I'm loading Dart, and this is a main, this is a main method, sorry, main function. But from the main function, I decided to use uh, classes, classes, right? So in here, no, not in here, sorry, in here, in the library. See, stock Dart, this is a class, stock. Not that difficult to read for Java developers. This is a stock generator. You have collections, list, and map. You, can, you have generics like in Java, right? So it's pretty easy for you to read. Everything technically like in Java. Very, very close. So if I want to run this, uh, this little sample, I right click in idea, and then do run. And the uh, idea happened to have their own web server, which run on this port. But again, I could have used pub server. If I will enter some stock name and I press tab, so it generates for me the price. Of course, this is not a real price. Just saying. All right, so now uh, let me show you a couple of other examples. Let me show you some examples. Actually, let me show you some isolates first. Isolates, remember, this is about concurrency. Concurrency. So when you create a standalone application, 
you don't have this web folder, you have a folder bin, which is kind of surprising. We, use, we assume that it should be in the source or SLC folder, but it, it's in the bin folder. But again, the structure is very similar. You still have this pop spec YAML, and, uh, and these are the, the, the program that you can run standalone from the command line, or you can run it, of course, from the ID. In this, co in this case, I assume that I have this method or a function again over here. That is slow. I, on purpose, I run it 80 million times. Let's do some dumb thing. And I want to run it separately, in a separate isolate. So what I do is, I create a new receive port. Remember I said isolates can communicate via uh, send and receive ports. So I want to start that isolate, and when it's ready, when it's done, I want to get some data back into main isolate. So what I'm saying is, I want to create a new receive port. These dots will be applicable to this object, right? And I want to listen. Whenever I will get something, I want to execute this uh, callback. I want to print. I got uh, the variable result. By the way, they have this nice feature called uh, interpolation. So dollar and variable name, or dollar in and uh, curly braces, and any expression. You can put right inside the string, and it will be inserted automatically. So what I'm saying is, I want to create a receive port. I want to create a listener. Whenever, whenever I will get something, I will take this variable and I will print. And then I, I spawn the isolate. See, I don't just call this function. I spawn it, right? Passing my own port. I'm saying I want to run this code, and this is my port, when you will want to talk to me, talk to me through this door. And this is concurrency. So now this program will run in, uh, in separate isolate, basically. So if I, if I will run it, down there it says spawn market news, and when this loop will be over, I will get back the uh, response. See, time to buy, and so on. So at this time, we had two isolates talking to each other. You, uh, let's say you want to have spawn URL. In this case, I want to dynamically load a piece of code and run it in a separate ISO. Check this out. I want to download something located in this file, which is right there. See? This code will be dynamically loaded into memory, and it will be able to talk to my other code. So spawn URL. I am invoking that, I am loading that class, I am passing John Smith through that port, right, and I am giving my port so you, they can talk to me back, right? On that remote object I say then, first I will receive the port, and then I will receive the message, hopefully. I don't do error processing over here. So if I will run it, again it will start the second isolate, and see the message? The main idol got loadable dart says hello to John Smith. Inside loadable, I did not hard code John Smith, right? So no cheating here. Now, another example, which is which I, I like a lot. It's a small example, but what I like about it, you can use multiple cores if you have my machine. And I of course I'm using MacBook and which it has four cores on my machine, so I will show you how, how it works. I will start four isolates now. Again, they, they do some dummy, dummy thing, but my point was, this is a dummy thing, iteration for up to 8 million, 8 million times. Every course is supposed to start, and I want to show you that they are going to be using multiple cores. This is an activity monitor from my computer, and each core has some kind of a what do we call it? Hyper threading, so each core has two threads, technically. But technically, I have four cores. See, now they are quiet. Now, check this out. I'm running this program, which will start four isolates down there. Check it out. And look at these, look at the CPU. All of them are working hard, right? So I'm done with that. Let me do real stress test. Something. What I will do, I will change the number of cores to 8. 
Do you know what was going to happen? Take a guess. See? All of them. Each four cores and each of them is running two threads. Is it nice or what? <coughs> Easy. It's embedded. And when you write, when you run this program on the web, same thing. At least I tested it in Google, Chrome, and in Firefox. Apparently, they know how to do this as well from the browser. Surprise, surprise. So it's IE. Hmm? Does it work in IE? I don't know, but uh, surprisingly, <coughs> IE is a leading browser. <coughs> the version Spartan, the leading browser in adoption of ECMAScript 6. So you better stop making fun of IE. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. They decided to change their editing. I believe. So this is the idolates web run. See? Same thing but on the web. So they are using I guess it is in Firefox again. In DOS the user. Hmm? In DOS the user. Yeah, <laughs> that's what that's the main goal. Alright, so one more example and, and we are done. Uh, at least I'm done. And I'll be happy to listen about the goal. <coughs> so one more thing. Uh, glass fish. I was. I decided to see, to see the situation. I'm using my IDE, the same thing as with Java, and I want to be able to do everything in the same IDE without leaving it. Right. So I created the module, uh, this enterprise Java module, and I said that I want to use the glass fish. So this is an example. WebSocket, a little simple example. This is Java. This is Java, and uh, what do I do? Let me close this. Uh, here? I see endpoint with, uh, dash, with slash clock, and uh, I show it to you on the side right here. The, the point is, I'm checking the time, the local time, right? And this thing, session get basic remote, will get me a reference to the client who connected to me via this web socket. It's not the only one that will get async remote and get basic remote. And then I'll be sending the text to it. I will, I'll be sending time, basically, every, uh, every second. That's the Java <coughs> part. Now, the dark part is here, in the HTML, nothing special. I already pre-compiled the dark in the Java script. Uh, and this is the dark part. Again, nothing special, it just, it wasn't the slide at all. I connect to this 8080. And I deployed it, uh, this artifact under Glassfish, under this name, slash clock, is that um, path thing. So on open, I'm listening uh, to the data coming from the server, and whenever I get the data, I put it in the out. What is an output? It's an HTML component, right, which I, uh, I get a hold of using this uh, query thing. It's over here. So what I will then, of course, what, I, what did I do? I created the run configuration for Glassfish. This is my Glassfish, by the way, which they broke two weeks ago or three weeks ago when, when the release of uh, Mac OS 10, 10 3 was out. You wouldn't be able to start Glassfish all of a sudden. So you, you have to start it in so-called their browser mode and they're you know, working on the patch now. So basically, this is a Glassfish configuration. I deployed one artifact as a warp exploded, right? After launch, I want to uh, start this line. The connection, this is a Glassfish, my installation. Then what happens is, because they, they, they broke the start, we have to use dash dash verbose, at least to be able to start. So that's Glassfish. And this is what I'm, I'm going to run now. And glass fish run. It starts, it gives a lot of output again because of the verbose mode. See, it started. And it's pushing data. It's pushing time to me. I didn't do anything, see? Hands. <laughs> I didn't touch anything. It's pushing. And this is Chromium. And you can say, of course, everybody can do it in Chromium because Dart is key. So let's do this URL and let's copy paste it in another browser. Uh, which this is Google. Google doesn't have Chrome, uh, Dart VM, and it also works, right? 
I didn't change any, any code. So we are deploying technically JavaScript. Let me start Firefox. And it also works. Right? So basically browser agnostic. We are in Chrome. Let me do this developer tools. Developer tools network. We have sockets. And let me do refresh. See this? Frames. Very complex. Check this out. 20 bytes. 20 bytes is my text. The current time is. That's all. No HTTP request. Several hundred bytes. No HTTP response. Pushing data. Nice and easy. All right. Okay. I think that's enough. If you have questions, please. You're not allowed to ask questions. No, no, no. I, this is the first time seeing a dark email. Know, um, so, when you're viewing in a browser that was you're seeing in JavaScript, so what happens when you ask to view the source of the script from the browser? From the browser, yeah. there, are, there are two cases. Case nine, the question was, how you, what happens when you see the source? If I would be uh, using Chrome, I wouldn't have Dart. I couldn't see the, the, the thing. But what they do have, they have source maps, which works nicely as with any other language that is compiled into JavaScript. So if you create a source map file, they are turning the code into JavaScript, but they have they, they keep the references, so you can debug your own. Other questions? Can we, can we look at that dart.js and see whether there's any the code? Oh, can you look at the Dart start the yeah, compiler? Yeah, yes, how? yes. The source is like, like over here. If you want to look at it, you go to sources. And that's the one. That's the generator. You can look at it, but it's huge. And it's not minif min min minified, which it should be and it can be. But the code is there. So technically, if you want to, do, to debug JavaScript, you can do it as well. But I don't think it's the right way. Yeah. Do you transfer objects between the web and server as Java objects? Like any program in Dart, right? How are you passing the objects as Java objects? Or uh, usually we pass JSON, to be honest with you, for the front. So, so consider it like you're writing a JavaScript application. I don't know, maybe there's some better way. Uh, we didn't do anything other than JSON. Other questions? So you said it brings structure to your uh, flex apps, traditional flex apps. Uh, you've showed some rudimentary examples here, <clears throat> but going to a complex application that has widgets and stuff, do you, how does it work with existing frameworks, say like AngularJS or maybe yeah, jQuery? Yeah, the question was how, how Dart works with existing framework like AngularJS. First of all, there is a port of AngularJS called Angular Dart, mm -hmm. and we are using it. We've been using it in that application. I don't know if, you get, if I have a connection. Easy and sure. So this application, and so this application is written in Dart. So everything here is in Dart. There is a, a library called Polymer with some um, GUI components. We started using it, and then we pushed it aside because it was not that uh, mature yet. But it's getting better now. So, but we we did use Angular Dart and uh, Dart for the front. So for for widgety applications, you would prefer Angular Dart. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can use you can use Bootstrap as well. For GUI. If you want. The one one of the things that is the weak point of Dart is as of now is inter interoperability with JavaScript. You know. yeah. They are working. Yeah. Um, what about Angular two point oh? Angular two point oh. I can reveal a secret. I started working on a book on Angular 2.0 with my colleague, and later this summer we are planning to run training over here in New York, ECMAScript 6, TypeScript and 1.5, and Angular 2. It's a big rewrite, and it's a serious improvement, and we like it. I mean, it's very uh, raw at this point. It's alpha. Thank you very much.